in becoming a homelessness activist, you actually have become, an, I guess, an anti-drug campaigner of sorts. You were actually a libertarian mm -hmm. previously. So tell me a, a little bit about how that evolved. Mm -hmm. So I am a libertarian, um, and like most, I used to believe in the full legalization of all drugs. I guess I sort of lived in a bubble and I just thought as long as you're not hurting anyone else, you know, who cares if you do drugs? I also thought the same for legalizing prostitution. Um, but what I've seen in Venice, it's made me question everything. Um, because I've seen people just addicted to these hard drugs and when I see them, I realize that they don't have any free will. And so it's really made me question everything that I thought I believed in when it came to legalization. Uh, when people use meth and heroin, it's just, they're not able to make decisions for themselves and it's just something that I realized that I was wrong about. You know, so walking on the streets with you today, um, you know, there's a lot of debris, um, there's a lot of, I don't know, potential fire hazards, certainly a ton of stuff that's not according to code um, or anything resembling that, at least to my eye. Um, you know, you had like parts of RVs basically jetting out into the road. We have a lot of public safety issues, uh, but one is fires. They've really emerged as one of the worst conditions here in Venice. Uh, the LA Times did an article recently and it showed that 54% of all LAFD responses for fires are homeless related. We have about 24 homeless fires a day in Los Angeles. Uh, recently at the Bologna Wetlands, there was a fire where 54 firefighters were needed and it burned five acres. It's incredible. And as you saw today, many of the homes in Venice are old wooden homes. Um, I myself live in a hundred year old duplex. And my worst fear is that, you know, a fire could take out the entire neighborhood. In January, we had a fire start on the Venice boardwalk. It burnt down a two-story commercial building. The building was valued at $26 million. The property owner is suing the city. The city is at fault, but at the end of the day, it's the taxpayers that are gonna pay for this. So what we keep seeing is that lives are endangered, property destroyed, and no one is going to take any action. So when we were walking today, you may have noticed on the RVs, uh, these hoses attached to them. And that's how the RVs are dumping their sewer. They're dumping directly into our storm drains. And unlike our neighbor, Santa Monica, Los Angeles does not have an urban runoff recycling program. So everything that you saw today, the needles, the trash, the debris, mass, and even people's sewage from the RVs, it all goes into our storm drains and it pumps directly out into the Pacific Ocean. So we actually have raw sewage pumping out into the ocean. We've seen many needles on the sand, especially after a big rain. What happens is it goes into the storm drains and it's washed out. Um, there was a time where we counted 15 needles because our storm drain on Rose Avenue empties directly onto the sand. It's, I, I didn't realize that it was this bad until about a year ago. I will never run barefoot on the beach again. I used to love doing that until I went to go do some due diligence for myself and saw the 15 needles there. I'm horrified now. I can't believe that I even lived here for so long and I didn't know that was happening. So one of the places that we walked by, it seemed you know intended to be a kind of solution to uh, I guess the, the issue of too many people out on the street is this bridge housing uh, project on, near in Main Street. So tell me about that. In 2018, Mayor Garcetti and Councilmember Bonin came to Venice and they pitched us bridge housing. They told us that with opening this 154 bed shelter, that we would be able to break up the encampments. We were promised a special enforcement zone where we would have additional cleaning and we would have extra security. We would have a special LAPD detail car specifically for that area. So in theory, it was great because if we accepted this program, we would get extra cleaning and extra security. It turns out that we got the complete opposite of that. During uh, the defund the police cuts, they took away that detail car. So we actually had even less policing. And then what you saw today, some of those pictures, the special enforcement cleaning zone, it was never enforced. And that's also due to COVID. Um, you know, COVID-19 uh, guidance, it's just allowed every elected official to just throw their hands up and you know, absolve themselves of any responsibility. 
And so what we saw is that the tents, you know, they started piling up right outside of bridge housing. Uh, right outside there were about 40 different tents. And what the city ended up doing was they had to clear that encampment because there was fires there. One of my neighbor's cars was parked right there and the tent caught fire and it, it totaled his car. Uh, we saw some of the palm trees that were destroyed and burnt. So the only way for the city to basically move the tent was they had to put up a large fence and then they put in planters there. Uh, they put in you know, succulents so that people could not come back. The longer that we leave people on the streets, the, the greater the increase that they will die on our streets. So we need people to come inside. And when there's more tents clustered together, that increases the risk that people are using drugs. Um, it makes them more of a target because the drug dealers, that's their market. They're looking for vulnerable people. So the larger the encampment means the, you know, the greater interest a drug dealer will spend on that encampment. I also understand that this bridge housing, that there's even drug dealing happening there. There's been people who have caught it outside. Uh, we hear that it's inside as well. Gang members and drug dealers will always find a way to get to, you know, their customers. Uh, we hear this too in permanent supportive housing, that there are people who get apartments on the inside. So that is their business. They are selling to vulnerable populations and when we put them together in big amounts, like 154 people, um, that just makes them easy prey for the drug dealers. I keep coming back to this question of interventions, right? Like, I mean, if it seems to me like this, for example, housing model or something could work if people were actually being helped to stop their addiction in this case. But if they're left unchecked, then it creates the situation that you're describing. I mean, why aren't these interventions happening? Well, if you look at bridge housing specifically, there are no requirements for going into bridge housing. You do not have to be sober. So if there's 154 people in there, let's say there's one person who really is trying to get sober, it'll never happen. Um, and that's because they'll be surrounded by people who are using. So on one hand, we're saying that we want people to come indoors and to sober up, but our policy decisions tell us otherwise. Um, there's really no chance for anyone to get sober in there. It's such a large population, and even if a few people are using, it could really trigger you. So you showed me uh, this string of RVs parked alongside the, this protected area, the Bologna wetlands. That's right, the Bologna wetlands are a state ecological reserve. Um, it is a, it's a state park. And we've seen this turn into a makeshift RV camp. There's people parked there. Um, it's really become a source of lawlessness. There's been multiple shootings there and multiple fires. Um, a recent fire there took 54 firefighters and we lost five acres of the wetlands there. It's kind of odd to think about tents and RVs that are, you know, essentially illegally parked or placed as being domiciles. And there's all sorts of, you were telling me, there's all sorts of troublesome side effects from this. And this is one of the issues that the police run into, uh, where they feel like they're handcuffed. Because if they're trace, uh, chasing a perp and they go into a tent and zip the tent up, they have to treat that tent as private property, meaning they would need to get a search warrant. The police cannot enter a tent. The same is for RVs. If it's being used for a domicile purpose, it has it is have to be treated the same as a residence. Um, also, what's happening is you know RVs um, they are allowed to have guns in their RVs as long as it's kept in a safe box and it's locked away. So we just see this absurd way of policing where our police are not able to enforce any laws. They're not able to keep the residents safe. They're not able to keep the homeless safe, and it's because they're not able to do their job. They're really handcuffed.